I'm excited to bring you the Mage Knight How to Play series. This, or better yet, this is where to start. I'll link my Mage Knight playlist to the end screen of this video and include the link in the description so you can easily find the whole series. I'll be adding more videos to this playlist as they're created, so if you don't see a video yet, it will be coming. So I'd be lying if I said that this was a light game. According to Board Game Geek, Mage Knight carries a game weight ranking of 4.3 out of 5. This means this game has a learning curve a bit on the high side. But my goal is to help you more easily overcome this learning curve. Ooh. Once you do, you'll find out why Mage Knight is currently ranked 24, <clears throat> sorry, 25th overall on Board Game Geek. This video starts by explaining the big picture of Mage Knight, so you'll be ready to start your first turn when it's done. So, with that said, let's dive in. In Mage Knight, you play the role of a liberator of the land, also known as a Mage Knight. You have been sent by the Council of the Void to overthrow the Atlantean Empire, Draconum, and Orcs that infest and rule the land. Once you overthrow these foes, you can finally bring stability back to the land. In most scenarios, including the one we're going to focus on, you win the game when you defeat the required number of cities. In our case, that's two. And cities are tough, as there will be multiple advanced enemies to defeat in them. In order to be able to defeat these enemies in the limited amount of time you have, you are going to need to quickly level up your character and equip your character with things like spells, artifacts, and crystals. On your turn, you'll play cards from your hand, activate units that you control, and use skills that you have acquired to be able to move, influence, and fight enemies. What's more is that cards and some units can be powered up with your limited resource of mana to use their stronger effect. So you'll find that there's absolutely no shortage of decisions you'll have to make on your turn. As you defeat enemies and level up, you'll be able to add more powerful cards to your deck like advanced actions, spells, and artifacts. At the end of each round, your deck gets shuffled and ready for the next round, so you'll have a more effective hand of cards to use on future turns. Leveling up will also increase your stats, like your armor and hand size, and gives you the option to recruit more units to help you out. Mage Knight offers a lot of replayability. There's 11 scenarios to choose from in the base game, from competitive to cooperative to solo. For this video, we'll focus on the solo conquest scenario, and I'll talk about the differences you'd look at when playing multiplayer scenarios. Another reason I like to focus on the solo conquest is because it ensures you get this game to the table, and if you do end up playing this with a group, you'll get comfortable with it before game night with friends. This game takes a bit of real estate on your table. I usually dedicate one side of the table for the fame and reputation board and all the cards and tokens that get set up next to this board. Then I dedicate the other half of the table to the map and the tiles. Also, when you set up, pay close attention to any special details noted under setup in the scenario description. And I'll point these out for the solo conquest scenario as we go. Start by placing the fame and reputation board in the center of its half of the table. Place the day-night board slightly below this board, and make sure the later day side of this board is face up. You'll next take two more mana dice than there are players. So for example, if you're playing with three players, take five dice. If you're playing with four players, take six dice. Since we're setting up for the solo conquest, we'll just use three dice. Now remember this next part, because we'll be doing it each time we end a round during the game. So you roll these mana dice, and we need to make sure that at least half of these dice are of basic colors. So in our case with the solo game, two out of the three need to be basic colors. And the basic colors are red, blue, green, and white. If not, re-roll all black and gold dice until at least half are red, blue, green, or white. When this is true, if there are any remaining black dice, place these over to the dark area of the board. 
Separate the tactics cards which look like this. Separate them into two piles, one for day tactics and one for night tactics. Place the night tactics next to the day-night board, and then place the day tactics spread out near here. We'll end up using those in just a minute. Separate and shuffle the circular enemy tokens and place them above the fame and reputation board. From left to right, it's going to be green, gray, purple, brown, white, and red. Shuffle the hexagonal yellow ruin tokens and place these to the right of the red enemy tokens. Find all the cards that have this orange Mage Knight card back and separate these out into eight separate decks. The first four decks that we'll separate out are the starting hero decks. Each starting hero card has a hero icon in its upper right corner. Place all cards with the same hero icon together in a pile and set these off to the side for now. Sort out and shuffle the advanced action cards with the fancy gold border surrounding the text. Now don't confuse these with the artifact cards which have a similar border, but the artifact card border is slightly different in that the accents surround the corner of the text. Place these advanced action cards face down near the upper left corner of the fame and reputation board. Then draw the top three cards from this deck and place them to the left of the fame and reputation board. This will make up your advanced action offer. Sort out your spell cards. These cards have two text windows displayed on the card. For the solo conquest scenario, find and put the competitive spells numbered 17 through 20 back in the box. Then shuffle these and place this deck face down near the upper right corner of the fame and reputation board. Draw the top three cards from this deck and place them below the deck to make the spell offer. So next, sort out all of these wound cards and place these next to the right of the spell deck. You don't have to worry about shuffling these since they're all the same. Then, your remaining cards should all be the artifact deck with the gold accent in the corner of the text. Place these face down to the right of the wound deck. Now we move on to the unit decks. So sort out the unit cards into two decks, one with silver backs and one with gold backs. Shuffle each of these and place these face down slightly to the left of the bottom of the advanced action offer. Now we're going to make the unit offer. Draw two more cards than there are players from the silver deck and then place these cards face up below the day-night board. In our case, since there's only one player, we'll draw three cards. Find room for all of the mana crystals somewhere near the board. I put mine up by the advanced action deck. Find your site description cards and the scoring card, and set these in a pile close to you or all the players if you're playing a multiplayer game. Next, take your city cards and city miniatures and place these in a pile together. So to keep my table from getting too cluttered, I'll set these out of the way for now and then bring them in when they're needed. Now, it is time to assemble our tiled deck. And then we're going to lay out the starting tiles for our map. For information on what type of tiles we use, how many tiles we need, and what map shape we'll use, we're going to need to refer back to our scenario description in the rulebook. So since we chose the Solo Conquest for our game, we'll look in the rulebook and scroll down to the Solo Conquest scenario. Under Setup, we see we need 7 Countryside tiles, 2 Core City tiles, and 2 Core Non-City tiles. We also see that the scenario uses the wedge-shaped map. As a side note, some scenarios use different map shapes depending on the number of players you're playing with. For example, if we're setting up for the full conquest instead of the solo conquest, you would use the wedge-shaped map when playing with two or three players, but then use the fully open map when playing with four players. If you play a scenario with a fully open map or a variation of this, Refer to page 12 in the rulebook for the setup of these. It's a little bit different than the wedge shape we're going to show in a minute. So let's first create our tile deck by shuffling all the greenback countryside tiles. We draw seven of these, keeping them face down, and put the rest of these countryside tiles back in the box. Next, we sort out the brownback core tiles into two face down piles. One pile with tiles that have a city icon on them, and then one pile that does not. Shuffle each of these piles and draw two tiles from each. 
Then shuffle these four core tiles together and place them on the table. Put the rest of the core tiles back in the box. Place your shuffled greenback countryside tiles on top of these. This makes up our tile deck that we'll use for the game. Now we can set up the starting tiles of our map. Our scenario uses the wedge shape map, which will build out like this as the game progresses. To start this map, find the double-sided starting tile. Look for the side marked with a small letter A, and place the side facing up. The map will grow out of the non-coastline side of this tile, so make sure when you place this on the table, you have room for the map to grow. Alright, so next, draw the top two tiles of the tile deck and position the first tile so the number on the tile faces the same direction as the letter A on the starting tile. And then orient the position of this tile so that the star shape and the circle shape match up from one tile to the next. Place the second tile next to this one in a similar manner. So next, resolve any when revealed instructions as seen on these site description cards. If you're not familiar with the site shown on the tile, just match the icon on the site with the icon on the site description card. On the left tile, we have a dungeon, a mage tower, and this is a keep. The dungeon site description card doesn't have any when revealed instructions, so we can leave that site alone. If we look at the mage tower site description card, it says we need to place a violet enemy token face down on the space. The token is revealed during the day if a player is adjacent to it. It is day, but no player is adjacent to it, so we can place a token face down. It's a mystery who's under this token. The keep is similar to the mage tower, except we place a gray enemy token face down in this site instead of a violet enemy token. For the other tile we placed, we have an ancient ruin site, another mage tower, and a marauding orc site. Again, place a violet enemy token face down on the mage tower site. For the marauding orc site with this saber, place a green orc enemy token face up on this space. This is noted on your site description card. And for the ancient ruin site, we look at its site description card and it says, place a yellow token here, face up if it's day, face down if it's night. Again, this scenario starts during the day, so we place this token face up, and our starting map is ready to go. Alright, when choosing your hero for a multiplayer game, determine an order of how you want players to select their heroes. Whatever order you choose, I don't care. Each player selects a hero and then takes all of their hero components over to their player area. We're going to set that up in just a minute. The player who selected their hero first places their round order token at the top left of the day-night board. The player who chose their hero next places his or her token below this one, and so on. For the solo game, you of course can choose any hero you'd like, but you still place your round order marker next to the day-night board. You'll see why in just a moment. Next, set up your player area. Since I'm using a narrow table, I have to set my player area off to the side of the table. It's going to be out of my main camera shot, but I have another camera on this main player area. Now when you set up your main player area, I sometimes use this box as about a reference of how big that player area needs to be. This is the regular Mage Knight box, not the Ultimate Edition. That one's going to be a little too big. So you place your hero card in the upper left corner of the player area. So next, you find your six octagonal level tokens. These have the same icon as referenced on your hero card on one side, and then they're going to have numbers or be blank on the other. Place the blank one in this area, and then stack the rest on your hero card. You stack them in the order with the highest levels, 9 and 10 on the bottom, and then decrease the order of levels as you stack them up. These will show your armor value and hand limit for your hero's current level. Shuffle and place your starting deed deck face down below your hero card. Again, these are the 16 cards we sorted out earlier with your hero's icon in the upper right corner. You'll need your hero's shield tokens, your hero's miniature, and skill description card. Put these close by. Shuffle and place your skill tokens to the left of your deed deck. For the solo conquest, we'll need to remove the competitive skill from this pile. To find the competitive skill, look at your hero description card 
and find the skill that's shaded darker than the others. Then remove the skill from the skill token pile and put it back in the box. Place one of your shield tokens on the zero space of the fame track and place another on the center zero space of the reputation track. And now you can draw five cards from your deed deck and this makes up your hand. Now for the solo and cooperative scenarios like we're setting up for, you'll need what's called a dummy player. And when I first looked at the rules for this, I thought, well, they're probably referring to me. <laughs> but surprisingly, that's not the case. Um, the purpose of this dummy player is to keep the tempo of the game moving. You'll see what I mean a little bit later. To choose this dummy player, you just randomly select one of the remaining heroes. You won't need all that hero stuff. You'll just need the hero card, round order token, and the starting deed deck of 16 cards for that hero. You just shuffle their deed deck and place his face down. Then look closely at the bottom of the dummy player's hero card to find these three colored dots at the bottom. And by the way, in case you're wondering, these dots are only used for the dummy player, not your hero. Place three crystals of each color on the dummy player's hero card. They get placed in this area at the bottom of this hero card, known as the inventory. So I'll give the colors for the heroes of the base game in case my dad, who is colorblind, ever watches this video and decides to take up Mage Knight. But it's white, white, and green for Norowas, green, green, blue for Goldix, red, red, white for Arethia, and blue, blue, red for Tovok. The last part of setup is drawing tactics cards. Again, I'll cover this first for multiplayer and then how it works for solo games. For multiplayer games, look at the order tokens on the left side of the day-night board, and whoever picked the last hero, or the bottom order token, gets to pick the first tactic card, and then players finish selecting tactic cards from bottom to top in the same order as these order tokens. By the way, tactics cards give you one special ability you can use in a round, and they also determine player order for the round. So the lower the number on these cards means the sooner you get to take your turn in the turn order. However, the tactic printed on the card generally isn't as strong as it is on the higher numbered cards. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Once all tactic cards are chosen, rearrange the order tokens in numerical order with the order token of the player with the lowest number tactic card at the top and the order token of the player with the highest number tactic card on the bottom. Then set the remaining tactic cards off near these knight tactic cards. Now for solo games and cooperative games, you'll have to read the scenario to see exactly how tactics are treated, and in what order the dummy player picks a tactic and when you do. So if we look at the solo conquest scenario, we see that we get to pick a tactic first, and then we pick one for the dummy player at random from the ones remaining. Arrange your order token and the dummy player order token in order. So the order token for the player with the lowest tactic number goes on the top, and the player with the highest number tactic goes on the bottom. The player with the order token on the top gets to start the game. So Mage Knight is a game played over a series of rounds, six in the case of our solo conquest. This includes three day rounds and three night rounds. And during each round, players take a series of turns where they try to explore, level up characters, recruit units, and find artifacts to ultimately meet the objectives as described in the scenario. For our scenario, that would be taking down both a level 5 city and then a level 8 city. At the end of the last round, you tally up your score to see how you fared. Even if you didn't meet the scenario objectives, although technically you failed, you'll still be able to score, just not as high. Of course, failure like this means that the game will taunt you to come back again and again until you can meet these objectives and prove yourself worthy. So believe me, I know because I'm still there. So going back to rounds. The rounds are either day or night. When you end a day round, the next round will be night, and vice versa. If you end a night round, the next round will be day. Day and night affects things like which dice you can use, how some tokens are revealed on certain spaces of the map, and how easy or hard it is to move through certain terrain on the map. We'll cover more on this in another video, and I'll put a link in the corner for this video once it's released. 
So just refer to the scenario you're playing to see how many rounds you'll play and if there are any special rules regarding day or night. During each round, players take turns in the same order as the order tokens. The player with the top order token takes his or her turn first, followed by the next token down, and so on. On your turn, you can either decide to take a regular turn, a resting turn, or you even have the option to forfeit your turn. We'll spend most of our time here focused on the regular turn, since this is what you'll do for most of the game. However, if you decide to take a resting turn rather than a regular turn, you'd be limited to mostly just healing your hero. And if you forfeit your turn, your turn ends immediately and you can't do anything else. Alright, so a regular turn has two parts that have to be performed in order, and both of these parts are optional. The first part of your turn is the optional movement phase, and the second part of your turn is the optional action phase. For example, you can decide to take the movement part of your turn, where you can move and or explore new tiles, and then after your movement, you would have the option to take one action. The action would be something like exploring an adventure site, engaging in combat with an enemy, or using influence to recruit a unit to join your forces. However, like I said, each part of a regular turn is optional, so you could just decide to move and not take an action, or you could also decide to skip movement and just take an action only. But you can't take an action first and then move. Remember, movement has to come first. The end of the round is announced when one of two things happens. When one of the players has no more cards in his or her deed deck and has no more cards in his or her hand at the beginning of the turn. Or, a player could announce the end of the round if he or she has no more cards in the deed deck at the beginning of the turn, but still has cards in his or her hand. When this happens, the player who announced the end of the round forfeits his or her turn, and each other player takes one more turn. For solo and cooperative games, the end of the round can also be announced when there are no more cards in the dummy player's deed deck at the beginning of its turn. At the end of the final round, for some scenarios, such as a solo conquest, if you met the scenario objectives, you win. To see how well you did, players tally up fame using the scoring quick reference card, and whoever has the most fame at the end of the game wins. In the case of the solo conquest, you record your score to see if you can beat this personal record in future games. For fully cooperative games, you take a team score following the rules in the scenario guide, and in competitive games, the player with the highest fame wins. So the last thing we need to talk about in this video, before your first turn, is how the fame and reputation track works. You need fame to level up, and you need to level up to defeat more powerful enemies to get more fame. It's like a close-knit relationship. You gain fame primarily by defeating enemies, but some cards let you also gain fame by using influence. As you earn fame, you'll move your shield token on the fame track. When you move your shield token to the next row on this track, you level up and either get to flip a level token on your hero card, or you get to acquire an advanced action card and choose one of your skills. We'll cover more on this in another video, and I'll put a link in the corner for this video once it's released. When you flip a level token, you not only increase your hero's armor value, and possibly hand size, but you gain another command token so you can take on another unit. You definitely want to level up, and you want to level up rather quickly. The reputation track on this board determines how well you'll interact with the locals, or in game terms, influence the locals. Certain enemies you defeat will increase your reputation, and certain other actions you decide to do on your turn, like burning a monastery, will decrease your reputation. Alright, the next video is going to be Movement and Influence, and once it's released, you'll be able to find it by clicking the playlist on the screen. This whole Mage Knight series will be available there once the videos are released. We are definitely going to get through this game, trust me. <laughs> I love Mage Knight, and I want you to do the same. So I'd like to first say thanks for all the feedback I've been getting on this Mage Knight series. This game is still going strong after all these years. It is unbelievable. Let me know your feedback in the comments, and hit the like button if this video helped you in any way. 
And of course, subscribe if you like the stuff you see on this channel. Subscribers are typically the first ones to find out about new videos. And we'll see you in the next one.